The next block that we are now looking into is this coplanarity constraint. So this constraint that we very briefly described before. And what we now want to do, we want to take this constraint, say something about the three vectors involved, and then derive a relationship from this constraint. Of course, my corresponding points generate constraints, and I want to exploit those constraints in order to estimate the relative information, uh, the relative orientation, sorry, between cameras. And I'm looking now into uncalibrated cameras. That means they are only straight line preserving. So I assume that um, a straight line is mapped to a straight line. That means I have no nonlinear errors. But I don't make any further assumption. So for the we are working with completely uncalibrated cameras, assuming these 11 degrees of freedom per, per camera. OK, so we said, OK, we have this triangle here. And this triangle, um, this is kind of the, the vector describing how I move from the projection center of my first camera to the second camera. And this is the direction from the uh, projection center of the first camera to the point in the scene and the corresponding vector to the same corresponding point in the second scene. So now I express this here with x prime, x double prime, because this is once the point seen in image number one and the point seen in image number two. In the perfect world, if we did everything correct, those points are exactly the same point now, this point x. So x prime and x double prime refer to the same point in space if the correspondences are correct. And what we want to do now is we want to kind of try to describe those vectors with quantities we used from, for example, the projection matrix matrices of our cameras and then use this to derive constraints. The, the, the constraint that I, that I said that we have is that we know that these three vectors lie in one plane in the 3D world. I can describe this with something uh, which is called the uh, scalar triple product or Spatprodukt in German, which can be expressed in this way. It consists of three vectors and these three vectors equal to zero. And this is the case if those vectors lie in one plane. So what is what does this expression here actually mean? So is everyone familiar with the um, Spat product? Okay. So it is an operator which takes three vectors in the three world. And so this is defined as a cross product of A and B and the dot product, the result, the dot product with C. So what I basically do, I compute the vector which is orthogonal to A and B and use the dot product um, with the uh, third vector. What it basically does, this expression, it computes the volume of this uh, parallel, whatever, <laughs> to pronounce this. <laughs> it's actually computing this volume over here. So if all those, so it's just from the, um, kind of from the illustration point of view, if this gives me a value of zero, that means I don't have a volume over here. And this is achieved if all the three vectors, A, B, C, lie within a plane. And this is kind of a generalization of the, the dot product taking into account three vectors. And this is its definition, so I only need to know how to compute a cross product and uh, a dot product. So nothing else is involved in here. We can say a little bit about the typical properties that the scalar triple product has. So um, it doesn't matter if I use A cross product B, the result with a dot product C, or A dot product with the cross product of B and C. I can even um, also swap A and B, and the only difference that I obtain is that I get a minus in there. This follows directly from the definition of the cross product. Um, I can also compute this as a determinant of this matrix, this three by three matrix, given the individual values um, that I have. If two vectors are the same, this is obviously zero because two vectors in the 3D world always form a plane. And if I have three vectors over here, there, two of them are not the same, and this equals to zero, that means 
that these three vectors lie um, in one plane. And this is kind of the thing that we are going to exploit. This was kind of a very brief summary of these um, triple scalar product. We're exploiting this fact and this is its definition. So the only thing you need to remember now, if you just, what, what we are now exploit now, we exploit its definition and we exploit this fact over here. Okay? Okay, so if we have, we're in this situation, we say we have this correspondence, then we know that this must hold. So is everyone, is it clear to everyone why this expression must hold for any corresponding point? If the points are corresponding, then these three vectors have to lie in a plane. And this is the, the thing that we are going to exploit. Okay, the, the first thing that we're now trying to do is we are trying to describe those vectors over here. The first step and the second step, we're describing this vector down here. And then we take what we computed, putting in, put it into this expression, and then use this information to derive a constraint out of that. Okay, so what do we know about our camera? We said, okay, we have an uncalibrated camera, means we have some kind of projection matrix P for the first camera and the second camera, and I know that it maps the point X to the uh, point X prime in my image of the first camera, and the same point is mapped through the projection matrix of the second camera into the point x double prime in the second image. Right? And if you say, how does this projection matrix look like? It has exactly this form over here. For the first camera, we have, it has an own calibration matrix. So if you use exactly the same camera, then those two um, calibration matrices may be the same, but if you have kind of two cameras, they may have a slightly different or even completely different calibration, then we have individual calibration matrices. The cameras may have a different orientation. So one camera from here looking in this direction on my screen, second camera from here looking on this direction on the screen, and they have a different projection center. Just as a reminder, what does this mean over here? This is a matrix. Um, which looks like this, so this is the identity, identity matrix, so this 3 by 3 block corresponds to this first matrix over here, and this is simply a vector consisting of these individual elements. Um, so just as a reminder what this way of writing uh, means. So I have this matrix, um, four columns and three rows, which has this form. So if I, and I assume I have my, um, I have this projection matrix, or if I have this projection matrix, then I can, and I know where this point would be, I could compute where the point is mapped to in my image. Okay? Yep. Okay, so the capital uh, characters was the 3D location of the point in the world. So X, Y is that, and if it's written in this form, it's uh, in homogeneous vector. Yes, exactly. And these are the coordinates in the image of camera number one and camera number two. So two primes is always the second camera, one prime variable always the first camera. And I know that this point must be the same. That's what I'm going to exploit at this point. Because it's a corresponding point, so it must be the same point in the 3D world which generates the image point in for camera number one and camera number two. But of obviously those two image coordinates will be different because the camera are different locations looking into different directions. Okay. So what I can now look into this uh, called the, the normalized direction, so the, the directions um, of the camera array in our object space. So where is this looking into? This is, can express this in image coordinates or I can also express this in world coordinates. But it looks and this gives me basically the, the direction of the ray. 
the normalized direction of the ray. You can do this for the first camera and the second camera, and this gives me the direction vector, which tells me in which direction is this ray pointing to. So how to obtain this vector is something I also did in the photogrammetry one course. So I get my vectors from the projection center to the point in the 3D world. Next thing which is missing is the base vector, which is the vector between the two camera origins. This is called B. It's computed very, very easily if I know where the cameras are. Just need to subtract the um, X, Y, Z coordinates of the first uh, camera location from the second one, and then I have my vector B. Okay? That's what I have. Okay, now I can take this information that I had before and put it into my constraint. So this was my coplanarity constraint over here. I said, okay, what, what goes in there is this normalized direction vector from camera number one. It's my vector B, and it is the normalized direction vector of the, um, from the second camera. Just basically a uh, search and replace of those three elements. Then I end up having this expression over here. I said, okay, what does this mean? I just take the definition of this triple scalar product and say this is this vector over here, dot product with B cross product with the second vector. This should be zero. What I now can do is I can actually rewrite that as the product between two vectors and some matrix over here. And this is a screw symmetric matrix. So a matrix which has a special form. Why can I do that? This is something which directly results from the cross product. So just to see why is this correct, why can I actually do that? This second step, so just a copy and paste of this second step over here. Why can I do that? So I said this directly results from the cross product, so I can simply say I compute the cross product of an arbitrary vector B1, B2, B3, cross X1, X2, X3. Just from the definition, this gives me exactly this expression over here. Just applying the definition of the cross product. And I can actually generate the same result exactly in the same way by using some matrix which has this special form over here times this vector x. So I can turn this vector b into a matrix and generate the cross product just by a multiplication of the matrix and a vector. So just as a small check, if we take this line, multiply it with this column, we get x1 is cancelled out. It's minus b3 times x2, which is exactly this expression over here, um, times uh, plus b2 times x3, plus b2 times x3, we get this expression. Same also for the second line there, x2 is cancelled out, and the third line, x3 is cancelled out. So multiplying this matrix with this vector gives me this result, which is exactly the same result than computing the cross product. So it's just a different way of writing that. So this screw symmetric matrix, or the um, sheaf symmetric matrix, um, uh, is a matrix which has rank 2. So it's not full rank, because of this zero diagonal over here. Um, and it's a special matrix where the matrix is equal to the negative of its transpose. Let's take the negative of its transpose, I obtain the same matrix. And there's just a different way for writing the uh, cross, -pro cross pro. Yes, please. Um, so this will simply simplify the expression that we have so that we can write this constraint as in a special form that we have a matrix and um, multiply it with the coordinates, the pixel coordinates uh, of our camera and then have a very, very simple way for writing these constraints. That's why we are going to do that. But it's just kind of a different way for writing the cross product. There's no black magic in there. It's just kind of taking this general form of the cross product, we obtain this vector, and we get exactly the same result if we multiply this matrix by um, this vector. This is something that you actually find 
quite often to simplify the expression that you deal with. Now, so I just do this transformation to express the combination of dot product and cross product through a matrix. Yes, uh, X dot T. So it's, 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 no, no, it's X line T. Yeah. yeah. There's a T, so then the T will be transformed in, right? Um, That's what the T stands for. Yeah, so, okay, so the, the difference is just I have the dot product. I could have, this gives me a vector as well. Yeah. So either write the dot product over here or write the transpose over here, okay. which gives me the same result. So it's either A dot B or A transpose B, which is the same. So the advantage of this is, this is a very common way for writing this. I just have a matrix multiply by two vectors. And it's just kind of an easy way for, um, for, for, so we'll see very soon how we can actually exploit that. And this is the, this constraint, formulating this constraint at this product, um, has a very nice property that we can exploit then for computing this what is called the fundamental matrix where this actually will end up very soon. Okay, so what we now do is we simply say, okay, we have, we, we have this expression over here and now we just take the definition of these two vectors and put it into this expression over here. We said, okay, this normalized direction vector was the um, inverse or the transposed of the um, rotation matrix, the inverse of the calibration matrix, and the original point in my image. So this is something that I measured. So these are the pixel coordinates of the, um, of the corresponding point in my camera image number one. So something I, I know. I know the pixel of the corresponding point. So that's good. So I do this. I take this expression over here, put it in here. And do the same thing for x double prime and put it in here. And then I obtain this expression. So this is the screw symmetric matrix. So this is a screw symmetric matrix over here. This here is just this expression transposed. So x transpose, x prime transpose goes over here k um, to the power of minus 1 transpose becomes k minus transposed. And this rotation matrix inverted becomes inverted transposed. Screw symmetric matrix and then this expression for x2 gives me exactly this one and this equals to 0. So it's just replacing my two variables. Let's say, okay, what I have now is well, this expression over here is, this is a three by three matrix, which contains information about the calibration of the first camera and the second camera, and the location in terms of where do the two cameras look to, and something about the baseline. And this should be zero. So let's simply, replace this expression here by a new matrix which we call F, F for fundamental matrix, so that this expression dramatically simplifies to X1, uh, X prime transposed, so the coordinate of the corresponding point in image number one, times this magic matrix F, times the coordinates of the corresponding point in image number two must be zero. And the important thing is this matrix over here, this matrix F, doesn't contain any information about these corresponding points. The only information which goes into this matrix F is something about the camera, about the location and orientation of the camera, and about the calibration parameters of the camera. And this is simply the definition of the fundamental matrix, simply by, if I have my matrix R, inverted, transposed, if I know that this is a rotation matrix, this is the original matrix, so this simplifies, and the rotation matrix inverted is simply the rotation matrix transposed. That's the only change that has been done here. So this is then the final definition of my fundamental matrix, 
with using this matrix F to define my coplanarity constraint. So it's just a copy-paste, it's two big red blocks, because it's a very, very central result that we have. So we can define this fundamental matrix for the uncalibrated camera, which is def defined like this. And this allows me, this fundamental matrix, to express the coplanarity constraint for corresponding point in a very, very easy way. So I can do that for any corresponding points in this image pair. The location of the corresponding point in image number one, the location of the corresponding point in image number two, both multiplied from the left and right hand side with this matrix F, must be zero. Yes, please. Um, so this trans negative transposed? Is this the question? Okay. Uh, let's go back and okay. Let's we can actually derive that from scratch. So we started with um, so this came from so we had x n no x prime no, x n prime transposed s b x n double prime equals zero right so you're happy with this one so far okay then we had x n prime x n prime was defined as this one over here so this is r prime to the power of minus one k prime to the power of minus one okay I have to be careful with the prime so i write it like this to not mix this up and x prime so if i transpose this expression so x n prime transposed is x prime transposed k prime minus t so it's inverted transposed um, r prime minus t inverse transposed which is x t transposed k prime minus t r prime because this is inverted and transposed if the rotation matrix turns to that and therefore I have this expression over here so I know take this result over here put it in here so then I obtain x prime transposed k prime minus transposed r prime my screw symmetric matrix b plus the same expression over here for the other variable gives me zero and this is exactly this result over here k prime minus t so in inverted transposed the rotation matrix r prime sb and the remaining part did this answer the question okay perfect any further questions at that point? So, uh, minus t just stands for minus one in brackets. T. Yeah. Uh, so, so k minus t is k minus one. Yeah, okay. Otherwise, you get completely crazy with all the primes and yeah, yeah. prime bracket minus one uh, inverted brackets transposed. Okay. So the fundamental matrix is the matrix that fulfills exactly this expression over here for the corresponding points. And the key thing is, it's not just one corresponding point, it's all corresponding points in an image pair. Because F doesn't depend on the corresponding points, it only depends on the cameras itself and the location and orientation of the cameras. And therefore, and this, therefore we can actually exploit that now this constraint that we have, but that's something we're going to do next week, saying given we have those corresponding points, we can compute f actually from those constraints. By having a large number of those corresponding points, I can actually compute f, and this is kind of the, the trick that we're going to do. Having two images, knowing a sufficient number of corresponding points, we'll start with eight corresponding points next week, we are able 
to infer how the matrix F should look like. And this matrix F contains all the information about the relative orientations of two uncalibrated cameras that we can extract from two images and corresponding points. Okay, so we have the uncalibrated camera. How many parameters does this fundamental matrix F should have? So there was one table just showed in the beginning. If you're able to remember what was in there. I think it was seven. It was seven, exactly. It was kind of seven parameters was the relative orientation I can compute. So the information about the relative orientation of two cameras that I'm able to compute from two images was kind of this seven degrees of freedom, the seven parameters. This is exactly the degrees of freedom that I have for F. Why is F seven degrees of freedom? So should, it's a three by three matrix, so I have nine values in there. But it's a homogeneous matrix, therefore I lose one. And I have this screw symmetric matrix sits in there with a rank two matrix, which reduces the um, degrees of freedom by at least one, because otherwise I wouldn't have a rank zero, um, I wouldn't have a rank deficiency in here. This, therefore, I have kind of, from a mathematical point, this seven degrees of freedom, or this F can have seven degrees of freedom, and these are exactly those seven degrees of freedom, which is the maximum I can obtain about the relative orientation of two uncalibrated cameras without having any additional scene knowledge. Therefore, this is a very, very fundamental expression over here. It's also called the fundamental matrix because it encodes all the obtainable information about the relative orientation of two uncalibrated cameras, which I get, with, can I obtain without having any additional scene knowledge. For example, locations of three points of the scene, something I'm not required, not exploiting here. Just, I don't know anything about the scene, except I know corresponding points, but I don't know where those corresponding points lie in the scene. If one looks at the different sources of this fundamental matrix, one has to be careful because there are actually two different definitions how this fundamental matrix can actually be described. So the one which I presented here is the one which is typically used in photogrammetry. There's another one which is typically used in computer vision and which also in the hartley Sisserman book um, in there. And this is, it simply depends if you take image number two or image number one as the first image. So um, in the hartley Sisserman, they have X double prime transposed F X prime. Photogrammetry, they typically use X prime, so first image transposed F, second image. So it's first image F, second image, second image F, first image. It's not dramatic. The only thing is that the one fundamental matrix is the other fundam fundamental matrix transposed. So you may have a different definition. They have the same properties, but they are just transposed. So if you do some mathematical derivation, looking up different books, you have to make sure you don't get mixed up because one is the transposed of the other. It's just depending how it is defined. Of course, there are two ways for defining it, image one, image two, or image two, image one, and there are two ways. So just to be careful, if you're looking into photogrammetry textbooks, you will typically find this expression. If you look into computer vision books, you typically find this expression over here. Or this this really book really turned into a kind of the Bible of multiple view geometry. Um, so it's very commonly used, um, this type of expression here. Just to have that said. Okay, so the next thing we can say, okay, given I have the projection matrices of my cameras, I want to now compute this fundamental matrix. Can we do that? Is this, yes, we can do that actually quite easy, we can do that. Okay, this, typically we have this, um, so this projection matrix was this matrix with um, three rows and four columns. And let's say we have this matrix P for the first camera, so P prime, given as a three by three matrix A prime and a vector A. So this is how it is given. I don't know R, I don't know uh, K, I just have it given in this form, so the most general form that we have. And what we now want to have is we want to compute the fundamental matrix 
given the projection matrices for the first camera and the second camera. Okay. How do we actually obtain that? We can obtain that in the form of this fundamental matrix. So this is the result, and we will now very quickly derive that. Is A, so this matrix here, inverted transposed, screw symmetric matrix, B prime, define in a second, or how B prime is defined down here, times A double prime inverse. So this is a result. We'll now show you how we actually um, get there. Uh, okay, I forgot my notes, but we can, I guess, do it on the fly as well. So um, we said P is A prime A. So this was just kind of having variables defining the first three by three block and the three by one vector and the definition of my um, projection matrix was that this is a calibration matrix the rotation matrix I3 minus X0 right so this was kind of the definition of my projection of my um, transformation matrix can use this expression and then rewrite that as K R minus K R X zero. Okay. So this is A. Okay. Prime, 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 prime. And this is A prime. Okay. Um, okay. So if I then the first thing that I do, the second thing that I need to do was, damn, I forgot my notes, but we'll manage in one second. So if I write down the, the definition of the fundamental matrix, go back one slide, that was K prime minus T, R prime, S B, R double prime, transposed, um, yeah, and k double prime minus 1. Okay. If I, and I told you that the fundamental matrix can be described in this way, that was what I was claiming, so let's see if this works out. If I say f equals a prime minus transposed s b a double prime inverse and just put this definition in there I obtain so I need to inverse and transpose this matrix so this is k r inverse transposed S B um, K double prime R double prime inverted. So it's just kind of filling this, which gives me K prime So to swap order twice because once it's inverted, once it is transposed. So this is minus T, then R prime inverted transposed results in R prime, S B, and then this is just inverted, so it's R prime, it's a rotation matrix, so the inverse is a transpose, K double prime minus one, which is exactly the fundamental matrix. Same, same, same the same, the same. Okay? So, this expression is correct. The only thing I left out so far was the screw symmetric matrix, which I haven't touched yet. 
The screw symmetric matrix only depends on B. And what I need to do is to compute B is I need to subtract the uh, centers of the, the projection centers of the cameras. So the projection center of the camera, the second camera is minus A double prime minus one A double prime. And the same for the first camera analogously. So just the B is just those elements subtracted from each other. So this looks like a slightly complex expression over here. But I can just use the elements of my projection matrix to compute my fundamental matrix with not too complicated derivations. So the key take home message is here. That's kind of this you received. If you want to compute the fundamental matrix and you have the projection matrices of your two cameras, you can do that in a very easy way. You just need to basically chop your projection matrix into a 3 by 3 matrix and a vector, take the 3 by 3 matrix, multiply it with this screw symmetric matrix, and the screw symmetric matrix is computed from the 3 by 3 matrix and the vector in exactly this form. OK? So take home message. If you want to compute the fundamental matrix and you have your projection matrices given, that is easy. It also supports the claim that I made before. The fundamental matrix doesn't depend on the corresponding points. It only depends on the cameras itself. So it's the same for all corresponding points in an image. Because it only takes into account the projection matrices. No information about the points itself is needed here. OK, so the next thing is what we can do is we can actually use this fundamental matrix. So given we know the fundamental matrix, we can actually create a statistical test if two points are likely to be corresponding points or not. But just checking how well is the coplanarity constraint satisfied. So the coplanarity constraint will not be satisfied perfectly, typically, because we always have, have noise for measuring our corresponding points. So the test, is it exactly equal zero, is, is unrealistic in reality, because we always have measurement noise. So x prime transposed f x double prime will not be zero. It will be, take values that are very close to zero, if we are lucky, but not perfectly zero. So which value should we accept to say these points are potentially corresponding points or not? What we can do is we can actually make a statistical test in order to estimate how far can we actually deviate from zero. We can do it in a rather straightforward way. So then you can look to our residual, which is x prime transposed f x double prime. And so we have some noise in the process, so those values over here have an uncertainty, and also the elements of my fundamental matrix may have an uncertainty. So I may take into account that there is an uncertainty between both. So now do some magic transformation, just in order to rewrite that differently. So what this vec means is simply if, if I have a matrix, writing this matrix as a vector, just by stacking the column vectors over each other. So this here is a scalar. So if it is a scalar, the vector function of a scalar gives me exactly the same result because it's a one by one matrix. So this is exactly the same. And now there comes the magic. If I have an expression like this, so a vector transposed times the matrix times a vector, I can write this as the, the second vector, the Kronecker product, the first vector transposed times the vectorized form of this matrix. So taking the fundamental matrix and just stacking the values on top of each other. So turning this into a nine by one vector. And this F is just the, is the short version of this one over here. So this just means that, so what, what, what this basically does is <coughs> this operation over here is basically a matrix vector multiplication and then a vector vector multiplication. So this expression over here. And it takes all the individual values which are summed up in this vector matrix multiplication and stacks them in a large vector. 
and then I just multiply the elements of x and x with the corresponding element of the fundamental matrix. It's just a different way for writing this multiplication. So the Kronecker product is defined in a very simple way. If A and B are matrices, in the general case, or vectors, and it's easier, it's just kind of taking all the individual elements of A and multiplying it with every individual element with B. So the first element of A multiplied with B and all the individual elements of A multiplied with B. So if I do this for this matrix as an example, it's the element of A times this matrix goes over here. The second element multiplied with this matrix which goes over here and so on and so forth. So there's a general form for matrices. If there are only vectors as I have it here, I turn out to, to simply get a very, very, very long vector over here. And these are kind of what this vector tells me if I, if I compute the, this, the, the, the Kronecker product of these two values. These are exactly all the pairs of values between the elements of, the, of these two vectors that occur in the um, vector, matri vector matrix vector multiplication. And then they are multiplied with all the elements of F and obtain this result. So have you ever seen that or is this completely new to you? New. Completely new, okay. Um, that will probably make an exercise so that this becomes more clear that this is exactly the same thing. Maybe because we will actually exploit that a few times in order to writing a very simple expression over here where we in the end see that all the individual elements of F for example are linear or bilinear in the two coordinates of the corresponding points. Because this turns into a sum where I always have kind of one single element of f times one coordinate of x1 with one coordinate of x2. And so I have a very, very, very simple form where I can very nicely see this linear dependency that I have. Okay, um, once I have that, we said, okay, in the beginning, so this is my residual that I have, and this is very seldomly equal to zero. Seldomly equal to zero. But what I know is, and kind of what I can obtain is that I actually have an uncertainty over here, a variance. And this variance has different sources. These are sources on how accurately can I measure the individual corresponding points. So how accurately can I nail down the pixel value of the corresponding point in image number one and image number two. There's this expression over here, this expression over here. And what is the uncertainty of the individual elements of my fundamental matrix? Of course, there may also be uncertainties involved in that. And just by variance propagation, I actually obtain getting this result over here. So it's just the linearization of this form over here or derive it with respect to the first variable, the uncertainty that I have associated to that, the same transposed. For the first, uh, for the for the first point, how accurately can I measure the corresponding point? Number one, the corresponding point in image number two, and the uncertainty of the individual elements of this fundamental matrix. Again, this assumes that we know the errors or the uncertainties. So we assume to know these uncertainties. We don't estimate them. So if I look to this expression now over here, so I take this element and derive it with respect to x1. So I said the nice thing is this is a linear expression. So simply all elements will cancel out where x1 elements. So this term gets very simple. Same holds for all the other because these are all linear expressions. Actually, these elements are exactly x double prime transposed, f transposed. Of course, everything, kind of the elements, so intuitively the elements where x1 is involved with the linear expression simply vanishes and the same holds for all the individual elements. So I can, just by putting those elements in here, I get a very, very simple expression in order to make a very simple uh, correspondence test by saying my z value is, uh, rem sorry, I, I simplified the expression, these two indices should go away, I forgot it here. So it's the residual that I have divided by the uncertainty of the residual should be 
distributed according to a normal distribution with standard variance. And this is exactly this expression over here, just by putting in the values I had before. By saying, what did I measure? The fundamental matrix, the uncertainty that I have about this measured point for the first one, the second one, and for the uncertainty I have about the individual elements of my, um, of my fundamental matrix. So I get my value over here, my Z value. It should be close to zero. I have a standard variance. And then I simply can define my confidence level, um, which defines me how far can I be away from zero. So for example, if I want to have um, a 90 per, uh, um, a 5% error probability, then I have a K value of whatever, 1.96. And I can simply look, how far am I away from this value? So how far is my F prime transpose, you know, X prime transpose F X double prime away from zero in order to accept or reject a corresponding point. So what I now have with this one, a statistical test to check if points are likely to be corresponding points based on how well are they in line with the coplanarity constraint. Okay, I'm more or less done now. The only thing I want to do is kind of having a very small outlook or preparation on what we're going to do next week. What we're trying to do next week is actually estimating the fundamental matrix not from the projection matrices but from corresponding points. So I assume I have pairs of corresponding points, and I'm using these pairs of corresponding points to actually compute f. So this is my goal. And from the way how we write that, we can actually see that um, the coplanarity constraint is um, linear in x prime, in x double prime, and in the elements, in the individual elements of the fundamental matrix. And this allows us, in a very simple way, come up with a um, system of linear equations of homogeneous form which we need to solve in order to compute the fundamental matrix. This is basically what I said before that this fundamental matrix has seven degrees of freedom. So it's a three by three matrix. So in general it would be in theory nine, but it's homogeneous so we lose one degree of freedom and um, due to the screw symmetric matrix which has rank two, we lose another degree of freedom. We can actually show that any matrix of this form is a fundamental matrix which has an orthogonal matrix U and V and a diagonal matrix in the middle where two values are larger than zero and one equals to zero. If you look to this form, you may realize there's a very hopefully known form of decomposing a matrix to you, which is a singular value decomposition. And this is one of the tools that we are going to exploit next week in order to compute f from those corresponding points. In theory, you need seven corresponding points, um, but we will start with a method which requires eight corresponding points, and which is a very simple way for computing that. And I want to end, actually, today with a video, which ah, so it gets pretty loud in here. Um, it's, it's a pity because it's what's called the fundamental matrix song. It's a very nice song about the fundamental matrix and its properties. So I hope the loudspeakers are loud enough to, to show that to show that now, given the guys are working outside. Uh, sorry.
Okay. Oh, I think abort that here. <laughs> and so, hope to, I mean, the link is here, so you can actually watch the video again. It's, it's slightly better audio than it was here, given the guys working outside. Um, but a lot of the things we learn during the next weeks is kind of what are the AP polar lines, what are certain constraints, I actually think that pop up in the video, so most of the information is, is in that video. Um, so that's it from my side for today. So what we discussed today, what you should know for next week is the, the basic ideas of the geometry of two images. So what means relative orientation, which is the information that we can get out from images without using any further scene information. So the difference between relative orientation and absolute orientation. What's a corresponding point should be pretty clear. That we can work with those corresponding points. What are the fundamental matrix? What are its properties? And maybe look up this Kronecker product. Well, I'm not sure if I will make an exercise now for next. Probably I will post a short exercise on this Kronecker product because that's something we're actually going to exploit during the remainder of this course uh, one or two more times. And we can actually use this the fundamental matrix if we know about the uncertainties of the elements of the fundamental matrix and how accurately I can measure my corresponding points. I can formulate a statistical test on compute, estimating if a point is a corresponding point based on the fact how well it is aligned with the epipolar constraint. Where do you find more information? So what I explained here, it, you find more or less one-to-one -one in Wolfgang Furstner's script. Um, and also in slightly more detail in the photogrammetric computer vision book in the corresponding chapters over here. That's it from my side. Um, are there any questions? Sorry? Many. Go ahead. No, no, not today. Yeah. Yeah, I so I know, so the, the, the things presented here, if you see them for the first time, requires going over it again. I strongly recommend look to the uh, script, maybe also have a look to the next chapter, what happens to get a rough idea. And what we're basically doing is the algorithm that was quickly shown in that video that we're kind of typing down in MATLAB um, in front of the Sydney Opera House is actually the, the eight-point algorithm or a variant of the eight-point algorithm. And this is the one that we are going to derive um, next week to have a method which allows us from corresponding points to estimate this fundamental matrix.